Broward County Parks and Recreation is the county's primary manager in charge of our native landscapes. The agency oversees more than 3,500 acres of natural lands, including archeological sites and restored wetlands, and indigenous flora and fauna. Aside from their historical significance, these lands improve air quality, provide clean water, and protect our county's biodiversity. Broward County Parks provides a myriad of educational opportunities to teach our residents about the importance of the environment and the value to our community. We offer nature classes, guided walks and hikes, lecture series, and 4-H programs to ensure a balanced lifestyle for our residents. Broward County Parks has educational facilities to visit as well, like exhibit halls and our nature centers. The Marine Environmental Education Center at the Carpenter House. partnership with Nova Southeastern University. We are committed to offering recreational activities to serve all of you. The division manages 6,500 acres, 22 natural area sites, 14 regional parks, 13 specialty parks, eight neighborhood parks, and five nature centers. Our division continues to stay abreast of recreational trends in order to provide high quality recreation experiences in our parks. And now, here is our feature presentation. The Herman and Dorothy Schuster Nature Preserve is an example of our efforts in land preservation, environmental education, and recreational spaces. Broward County Parks and Friends welcome you to a journey through this urban oasis we call the Schuster Nature Preserve. Here is a brief timeline highlighting its history. According to South Florida Vegetation Map, in the 1940s, the land was composed of cypress swamps and pine flatwoods. In 1974, Herman and Dorothy Schuster moved to Fort Lauderdale from Pennsylvania. They bought Ding-A-Ling Answering Service, a small phone service company that would become a global response call center and one of the largest employers in Broward County. From 1984 to 1990, the site was scheduled to be developed as the Forest Office Park. The project fell through and was never completed. But two of the eight planned office buildings were built in 1987. Before we continue, here is a fun fact. Schuster Nature Preserve contains a mature cypress dome with large pond apples, a habitat that is increasingly rare in Broward County. It was originally part of a system of cypress domes east of the Everglades. Now, let's continue with our timeline. By the 1990s, much of the area surrounding the site was developed. By 1995, homes were built on one of the last open fields to the south. March 2004, Broward County purchased the natural area from 777 properties for $4.1.5 million using funds from the 2000 Safe Parks and Land Preservation Bond. Part of the agreement was to name the property in honor of Herman and Dorothy Schuster, who formerly owned the parcel. In 2010, it was officially named Herman and Dorothy Schuster Nature Preserve. Here is another fun fact. More than 75 species of wildlife have been documented in the preserve, including 43 species of birds, 18 species of butterflies, seven species of mammals, five amphibians, 
and three reptile species. In 2014, Herman Schuster passed away at the age of 89. In 2016, Dorothy Schuster received the key to the city of Margate for her leadership and philanthropy. In October 2020, the Herman and Dorothy Schuster Nature Preserve opened to the public. This nature preserve has a relatively young but fascinating history. Today, the Schuster Nature Preserve is found in a community thriving in cultural diversity. So, what are the benefits the Schuster Nature Preserve brings to the community? So the Schuster Preserve is designed to benefit the surrounding community by providing an area where people can come, visit nature, take a nice walk through the site, decompress from the urban world around us and just kind of look at what old Florida used to look like. It's a two-part mission. One is for people to come and enjoy the natural beauty of this park and another one is for the ecological restoration of this area. We have a boardwalk back here which goes through the, Cy the cypress swamp. It's a beautiful refuge for people to come in and enjoy. There's a pavilion in the middle where you can go and get a sense that you're not even in the city. And there's also a sidewalk that leads to picnic tables so that people can come spend time with their family, with their friends, and enjoy the natural beauty that Schuster has to offer. Yes, all Broward County parks are ADA compliant. And what I mean by that is we, when we construct them, build them, and maintain them, we make sure that they are equal access for everybody of all ages and abilities. We make sure that uh, they're safe, that they are an opportunity for people to learn about education, the preservation, and have enjoyment and recreation in the parks and the nature preserves. When it came time to open the site, there was one last big task that we needed to do to make the site safe and beautiful for the public. We had to come in with a work day and pull all of the garbage and debris out of the site. There was 45 cubic yards of trash debris that had been dumped in the site and that we were able to pull out. Everything from car parts to appliances, tires, trash and debris, and it really took uh, a cooperative effort from several different sections of parks to come in and work on that together. And so what this did was give space for the plants to come in and thrive and provide a space where people can come and enjoy the natural beauty of this area, unencumbered by the touch of humanity. So Schuster Preserve is really unique in that it's the intersection of a series of different habitats from pine uplands, you have an oak hammock, you have a cypress swamp in the back. These little pieces of habitat um, are what the whole surrounding area at one time did look like. And they provide habitat for the wildlife, um, the plants that need those ecosystems. And Schuster also provides a view for the people that live in the area or visit the site to see what those habitats resembled. Before the county acquired this land, it was actually slated for development. So this could be a series of apartment buildings. But what you have in a sense is almost a natural history museum where you get to come experience the plants and the animals that were in this area before people came here. And you know, development is, it's like a one-way path. So once something's developed, that area is ecologically gone forever. So what we do here is try to preserve the last remnants of these ecosystems so that we have the plants, the animals, the butterflies and birds that are here for everyone to enjoy and so that people regain that connection to the land. So there is a, a several different natural areas that are scattered around that have remnant cypress communities. It's really an interesting history what uh, led them to be what they are today. The surrounding areas were farmed and those farmers, what they would do is as they, they dried out their fields, they'd pump the water into these little cypress domes of Woodmont, of Tall Cypress, Schuster Preserve, and Tradewinds, and even into Fern Forest. They'd pump the water into those cypress domes 
And then decades later, we you know, developed these areas for our homes, our neighborhoods, and the wetlands, they just remain dry and, and high above the water table where they should be, they should be in the water table. So when we buy these natural areas, one of the first things we do to the Cypress areas is try to come up with ways to bring the water back. And usually in the north part of the county, that means pumping into the natural areas so that we can bring water to the Cypress. This preserve, Schuster Preserve, acts as a corridor so that birds and different animals can use all these sites and travel in between them. And it also fosters the genetic diversity of the plants as pollinators move back and forth between the sites, carrying pollen and help the reproduction of the area. So really the more sites that we have, it increases the strength and the robustness of the rest of our sites. So the ways that we uh, manage the sites, one of the most important things that we need to do is to manage the exotic species, the invasive exotic species. And what we're really talking about primarily are the plants. Plants that are not native to an area that have a competitive advantage, that maybe reproduce faster, grow faster, spread a lot of seeds. What can happen is that they can come in and crowd out the native plant community. And that completely can change the area and not allow it to be really viable habitat for wildlife. You can have a forest, but if it's dominated by an invasive species, that forest might not be functioning as habitat for wildlife or for even the plant community. So our goal for managing the invasive plant species is to reduce their populations to less than 5%. We really would love to see 0% and have it completely dominated by the native community, the native plants and animals. But that goal to reduce it to that level is really important because the exotic plants can really just completely change an ecosystem and crowd out the native species. So we really strive to keep them as low as possible to allow the natural community to thrive. Our natural areas are, generally, we, we do fence the natural areas. Uh, one of the important things that fencing does, yes, it protects wildlife that is inside the area to some extent. It keeps perhaps dogs from the neighborhood out, reduces that, it may keep cats out that don't want to jump the fence. People don't really realize the impact that feral cats and dogs can have on the natural wildlife. Cats are really prolific hunters and will devastate natural bird populations. And so it's really important that we have these fencing and these barriers to kind of keep out these animals and also just protect what's here in the park. And it can, to some extent, keep some of the wildlife in, but one of the most important things that the fence does is it actually helps reduce dumping. Because a lot of times when we, ha when we have these natural areas next to a road, we often will get trash and debris dumped right into the natural area because people don't realize maybe what it's functioning as, that it's really providing habitat, and they just see it as an open area to dump you know, debris. And the fence just kind of protects the rest of the area and keeps people from just walking in any direction. So some of our areas actually have a natural buffer and usually that's the vegetation. For example, saw palmetto can act as a natural buffer and keep people out, keep dumping down to a minimum because it's actually just like it sounds, saw palmetto, it's a little rough, it's got sharp edges and really grows very thick and it can act as a very good buffer for people and for uh, to reduce debris and keep, kind of keep that natural protection. Water is also another great protection. Um, if there's a water body on the edge of a wetland, that also helps to keep people from coming in and going wherever they want and helps to reduce dumping and can help protect the plants and animals inside. Broward County Parks and Nature Preserves are deeply committed to not only preserving and protecting our beautiful sites, but also providing an opportunity for people to obtain environmental education. There's so much about Florida that's changed through the years, and in these beautiful areas, they're preserved and protected in a way to help people learn about what was in part of Florida's past. Schuster Preserve is designed with the public in mind. We preserve it for the ecological significance, but we also, it's really important for us as the county to have people really come interface and engage with the property. And so 
You know, studies have shown that being in green space and in natural areas increases happiness and a sense of well-being. And so it's really important that these areas are accessible to people in the public and into the neighborhood. So Schuster Preserve really is a green gem in an urban oasis. I mean, while you're in the site, you might be looking at cypress and pines and kind of feel like you're in the woods, but you still may hear planes flying overhead and cars driving by because it really is surrounded by the urban community. I remember the first time I walked into the site when we had just purchased it back in the 2000s and it was just ringed by invasive species like Brazilian pepper. But what then we broke through that and walked into the cypress swamp and saw the pond apple and the swamp ferns and these huge cypress trees and it was just such an amazing sight that this little green oasis had been preserved over the years. So yeah, while you're here, you may still feel like you're in the woods, but still be hearing the urban sounds around you. Thank you for taking the time to learn about the wonders of the Herman and Dorothy Schuster Nature Preserve in this Urban Oasis series. For more information about our natural areas, please visit our website at briard.org forward slash parks.
Uh, it, good morning, everyone. It is 10.08. I see we have seven commissioners present, which is what I normally like to have when I start a meeting. Um, I will ask everyone to stand for the pledge, which will be led by Commissioner Mark Bogan. Pledge. Good morning, everyone. Um, today's after our marathon meeting on Tuesday. Hopefully, today's will be mercifully brief. We'll find out. Uh, I'm not sure that the nine of us can be brief on anything, but we'll, we'll, we will do our best. Um, uh, today um, is strictly a budget workshop, and uh, will you be okay? And we will start off with a OMB presentation. Yeah, commissioners. I'll just introduce the overview we we're hearing today from the Broward County Clerk of Court and then the County Administrator. The status of the submissions um, and how the budget looks at this point. Uh, we're going to start off first, though, with the County Administrator is going to do um, one slide and then introduce the Clerk of Court. County Administrator, you're recognized, ma'am. Thank you very much. I know for some time now we have been uh, at least uh, advising the board that there were uh, some, const um, some constitutional changes that affected our charter and one of which gave, um, uh, uh, created the uh, clerk of courts uh, position with expanded responsibilities from that which we um, tr traditionally know of today. Because our charter, uh, a lot of those responsibilities reside with county administration. And so when um, the, the uh, ballot initiative passed, that became a statutory constitutional position and it has certain responsibilities. Um, at that time, Representative Jacobs um, worked with both of us, to, to, to the, the clerk, and ourselves to figure out how might we um, make an amendment to that constitution uh, change that would have us agree on what services should remain with, um, with county government and that which should go to the clerk of court. The clerk um, would advise you that generally speaking, she is the only clerk in the uh, state of Florida that does not handle uh, recordings. And that's a substantial um, income for uh, many of the clerks around um, the state that she doesn't get to enjoy. So what we provided you was this. I don't have to read through it. That's it in a, in a nutshell. And with that, um, again, um, I apologize. We have traditionally not had um, our um, Article 5 constitutional officers at our, at our workshop, but because of this unique circumstance, um, she wanted to be able to present to you some of the challenges that she has um, that precedes when the technically um, the, the official change occurs. And so with Thank that. Um, Brenda Foreman, the clerk of courts, please come up and you're recognized, ma'am. Thank you for being here today. And uh, I said you're recognized and we're happy to hear your remarks. Good morning, everyone, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, and County Administrator. I am glad to be here today to discuss our continued partnership regarding Amendment 10 and the local bill we negotiated with the late and honorable Kristen Jacobs. I am truly blessed to have worked with Representative Jacobs on this important matter to the operations of our county. The two-year local bill legislative effort in Tallahassee provided the opportunity for the county and for my office to come to a mutual agreement that was overwhelmingly approved by our joint constituents. As discussed during our negotiations, my office is the only clerk statewide without both a county partnership and official records to provide additional sources of revenue 
for information technology, the needs through cost allocations and other efficiencies. In anticipation of transfer of the recording and the duties and the functions, my office has technology needs that must be addressed now. The expense to upgrade our technology for the recorded duties and functions is not an Article 5 funding item, but rather in an expense that the county and my office must resolve to ensure an orderly transition of the official records. The immediate financial need is $3.4 million to stabilize my technology department. I anticipate requesting additional financial resources to specifically address the orderly transition of the official records. To provide this additional request, my office needs active participation from the county to understand the full impact of the transition. I am now going to ask my general counsel, Allison Charlie Davis, to provide an additional context of the local bill that brings us here today. Allison. Ms. Charlie uh, Davis, is it? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for being here today, ma'am. You're recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Clerk Foreman, and good morning. My name is Allison Shirley Davis, and I am the clerk's general counsel. Not to belabor the Article 5 funding issue, but rather to provide a backdrop to the local bill's negotiations, I am going to provide a brief summary of the clerk's litigation against the state. The Broward clerk brought suit against the state of Florida, contending that the clerk's office was unconstitutionally underfunded. As the appellate court stated, quote, the trial court found the filing fee statutes were unconstitutional as applied because they rendered the clerk's office unconstitutionally underfunded. Although the appellate court reversed the lower court's decision, the appellate court did find the Broward clerk was operationally underfunded. With the clerk's lawsuit in mind, in our local bill discussions with the county, the clerk asserted that Broward County's court-related services are uniquely and inequitably, are uniquely inequitable because of the lack of funding, because of the official records, and a partnership with the county. To illustrate this point in a very simplistic manner, other clerk's offices charge a portion of the salary of the elected clerk of the court to the Board of Commissioners, another portion to the Official Records Division, and a final portion to Article 5 courtside funding. Instead, in Broward, 100% of the clerk's salary cost is paid by the clerk's limited Article 5 funding. This cost allocation concept applies to all of the overhead departments and in turn reduces the financial strain on Article 5 funding and the clerk's technology division. In essence, the Broward clerk is uniquely and historically disadvantaged in comparison to clerks statewide that have these structural efficiencies. Thus, the reason the clerk required specific language in the local bill enabling the county to provide the clerk financial stability to remedy those financial inequities. Some of the authoritative language in the local bill addresses the earlier transition date and the issues associated with the orderly transition of the official records. As to the effective date language, the local bill states the transition date will occur on January 7th, 2025 or an earlier date. The clerk insisted on the earlier date language to address the immediacy of the clerk's financial needs, which in some aspects can be resolved by the transfer of the official records. As to the local bill language addressing the orderly transfer of the agency, the local bill provides the legal authority for the county and the clerk to enter into an interlocal agreement quote, providing all funding appropriated by the Broward County Board of County Commissioners related to the recorder functions and duties in fiscal year 2024-2025 or an earlier date to which Broward County and the clerk of the court agree. Therefore, the local bill provides the authority to grant the clerk's requests. 
Further, the local bill provides language stating that the interlocal agreement can also address, quote, other such issues as may be agreed to by Broward County and the clerk of the circuit court to effectuate the orderly transition of the recorder functions and duties. Once again, this language supports the clerk's request today and future requests regarding the transfer issues. The clerk is here today in good faith to fulfill the requirements of the local bill and our shared interest in providing quality services. To our constituents' benefit, the local bill ensured the county retained its treasury and other functions while providing the clerk the official records and financial considerations. To that end, the clerk's chief technology director will now address some of the items to stabilize the clerk's technology operations. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, ma'am. And sir, what is your name? Good morning. My name is Ernie Nardo. Okay, Mr. Nardo, thank you for being here today, sir. You're recognized. For years, the clerk's technical infrastructure has been supported by accumulated reserves from the Public Records Modernization Trust Fund. As a result, my department has had to extend the system life cycle of infrastructure equipment beyond the industry standard and halt hiring against key IT positions to save money. For example, technology, technology equipment such as servers and PCs have an average life expectancy of three to five years. Many of the clerk's servers and storage systems are more than 70 years old, and we still have about 400 desktop computers that are 10 to 14 years old still in operation. The department is currently operating with a skeleton crew of 23 positions out of 41 positions. The current situation is that the modern session trust fund reserves have been fully depleted, and ongoing revenues I hereby are barely sufficient to cover personal costs let alone IT operations and new project-related expenses. To ensure and prepare for the successful transition of the official records, we are requesting $3.4 million in emergency funding to restore the clerk's technical infrastructure to industry standards. These funds will be used as follows. $1.125,000 for recurring annual salary and benefit costs for critical technology personnel to refill 11 out of the 17 currently vacant positions. $1,730,000 to replace the aging, uh, aging IT infrastructure components and implement disaster recovery. $353,000 to leverage artificial intelligence and robotic process automation to streamline the manual and repetitive processing of documents in the clerk's e-filing system. We intend uh, to employ this technology to automate the document recording process of official records as well. $200,000 for information security multi-factor authentication. So as you can see, uh, many of these items have to uh, deal with uh, information security as well. The clerk staff uh, looks forward to working uh, with uh, county staff to identify requirements and associated costs required to support the transition of official records over to the clerk's office. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. I was going to let them finish and then take questions for oh, all of them. I just wanted okay to know you. if he had that document. Okay, sir, can you please share the document? Do you have a copy of what you were just referring to? I do. Okay, could uh, Monica, can, who should get it, if you could give it to our de uh, deputy county administrator slash county administrator designate. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank you, sir. Are there additional speakers on behalf of the clerk's office? Okay. And please identify yourself. Uh, <laughs> uh, Senator Smith, thank you for being here today. Chris You're Smith of Chip Scott on behalf of the clerk of courts. Thank um, you, Senator. Just to um, bring this home, I know we have a tight agenda. Uh, this is a continuation of the negotiations we had. Once, order, once the amendment passed, we knew this was coming. We talked to your staff um, as we did the local bill in order to make sure that Broward County didn't change as much as the constitutional amendment did. 
at the time that we negotiated and did the local bill, your staff said that it would take tens of millions of dollars in order to effectuate the constitutional amendment. This is just a small portion of what your staff said it would cost if we had gone with the constitutional amendment. So it's $3.4 million is a, is a start for us to be able to take the recording process into the clerk's office while we negotiated to allow the county and we went hand in hand on the local bill to allow the county to keep the, the other fiscal aspects um, so that Broward County wouldn't be interrupted as much um, according to the constitutional amendment. And we'll take any questions that you have. Thank you, Senator. Um, or are you the last speaker? Yes, sir. Okay. I was going, I wanted to finish since you're yes. the last speaker. Mm -hmm. Let me first ask if there's any questions for Senator Smith and then at the conclusion of questions for Senator Smith, if there's questions for any of the other three speakers that we've heard. Commissioner Honus, did I see your hand up. Well, I don't know that I have a question specifically for, for him, but I see okay. that I'm the first name on your list. Okay, well, uh, Commissioner, I will call on you as our first speaker. Right now, I just want to know if there's any questions for the speaker who's up here. No, but you will be the first speaker. Um, yes, uh, the right, uh, Vice Mayor. I just wanted to confirm with, I think, the speaker on the technology. The, the 17 positions that you mentioned that are understaffed, is that simply 17 positions in the tech department or 17 positions in the clerk's department in general? Are those are just technology. That is 17 tech. positions in the technology department alone. So basically what happened throughout the years, we... Uh, uh, sorry, you have I'm to sorry. get to the mic, please. Those are 17 positions just in the technology Senator, department no, 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 alone. Yeah. Okay, so the clerk's technology division is 17 positions. 17, it's 41 positions total, 17 positions are vacant. The, okay, that's in the clerk's office in general, that's just the technology? Just the technology department. There's 41 people in the clerk's technology division? Yes. There's 41 positions historically in that, in that department. Okay. Out of that, 17 positions are currently vacant due to funding, uh, uh, funding issues. Okay. Well, all right, let me, let me tell you how I would like to do this. First, we'll take questions, first of Senator Smith, then of any of the other speakers. So first, questions. At the conclusion of questions, we will go into debate, or the first, or actually, co not debate, comments from the commission. First name in that will be Commissioner Honus. At the conclusion of that, I'm gonna ask, are, you've heard from the uh, county, from the, general counsel for the clerk, I would like to hear from our general counsel and county administration. So right now, just questions. Yes, okay, I saw Dr. Sharif with first question. I have, then, a, question. I have a question, and since okay. it's the way you want to do it, I, I Okay, well you then, Commissioner Honus, first May question I? for any, for Senator Smith first, or that any of the other speakers. Mayor, yes. point of, just point of order. I, it, it, before we start asking all kind of questions, would, yes. it, would it make sense to hear from county admin? I would like to hear on, county admin. On all so of this, I agree and with I you. I think that might help on the Commissioner Fur, well stated. So, um, first, let me call on county attorney's office, and then I will call on the county administrator. Um, gentlemen, you can be seated momentarily, and then we'll take questions. County attorney's office, then county administrator, then we will go back to questions, then we will bring it in to the commission for questions and comments. Thank you, Mayor, and, and <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna turn this over to Ms. Ashton. Uh, this proposal has not been vetted with us. Uh, I don't believe there's a legal obligation uh, for us to pay this money. I think it's an ask. It, it, it may make sense for you to do it. That's something that the county administrator uh, can speak to, uh, but we have not been involved in discussing this ask at all. Uh, so I, I would just say, and uh, if Ms. Ashton wants to add to that at all, that we don't believe it's legally obligated. Uh, it's just something that's discretionary. Okay. Did you have anyone else from your office that wished to speak? No. Okay. County Administrator? Is there a county, or County Auditor, is there a County Administration position on the ESC? So there's no dispute that we had um, uh, uh, negotiated um, with um, um, Representative Jacobs on the duties and the split of the duties um, to be retained by the county and that, that which 
would go to the clerk of court. Um, there, um, the clerk of courts is correct that we have uh, agreed to have two teams come together to develop a transition plan to move those responsibilities that remain under the um, under the agreement that we you know that we have. So the question at this point um, is. Uh, First and foremost, the teams will start, they, they have their first meeting coming up next week. Um, we will begin to work through all of those transitional issues. Um, I'm sure IT, I have a representative from our IT department that will be part of that transition. There's a representative from the recording, um, our staff to their staff. So we have like positions that will begin that discussion and that transition. Um, and I don't have a specific, um, the clerk and I did not specifically speak to um, prior to this meeting about what the official asks would be. So that's something that we'll um, entertain as part of the discussions that um, we will have with you today and then prospectively for our August meeting. So county administrator or county auditor, do you have any recommendation for how we handle this? Today, I understand that at the August meeting, there have been further negotiations. Is your recommendation today we just listen and then in August, um, you and the clerk will have had an opportunity to negotiate? That would be my recommendation because what we want to do, um, you heard the clerk said that there were additional asks. So today, um, there's the um, the the IT um, asks, um, there are other asks, and at this point I don't have a list of all of what the, the complete total uh, of those asks would be and how they would be spread um, over the transition period, but we want to get to that point. We know that we have nearly 50 employees that work in our recording area. The question becomes, um, you know, and, and a lot of those individuals perform different tasks. They perform the recording functions, but they they perform other tasks on our behalf. So we really, we really are going to have to sort that out. And um, I'm happy to, you know, between now and then, we get that transition issue worked out so that when we come back to you in the fall with the, with the final recommendation for the budget, then we would have worked it out. I understand. County Auditor, you're recognized, sir. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. I wanted to uh, just uh, provide some background information on this since I think I'm the only one on the dais that's had significant experience in the clerk's office. I was several years in Lake County Clerk's Office, several years in Pinellas County Clerk's Office, and in the Orange County Controller's Office, which has the county-related duties of the clerk. So I'm familiar with the operations, and so I just wanted to uh, you know, make sure you're all aware that clerk's offices across the state have definitely had severe funding problems ever since the change in state law, the Article 5 situation. And they have a very strange budgeting process that they go through on their court-related functions. Now, most of the, of the other clerks in the state have their normal court-related functions as they do here in Broward. But most of the other clerks in the state also have the recording function, they have the finance function, and they have the county audit function. And so therefore, uh, and they also are a clerk to the board, that's another county function they have. So most clerks have two effective budgets. One is the state budget, the court budget, which is dealt with through the, the, the clerk's operations corporation, strange process, but that's for court related items. And then the other clerks come to the board for the county related items, which is normally finance, the county auditor, and, and then for the recording. And so, you know, when the clerk talks about most counties or they allocate the cost to the clerk and the administrative staff and so forth, that's very true. But the reason is because they spend time on county related functions. So that's very different than the situation now that we have in Broward. And, you know, I will say that because of the, when the, the clerk in their court function has a severe funding shortage, they have basically two options that, that I that I know of, and one is to come to the board of county commissioners and ask for a subsidy, ask for help, which I do believe some have done across the state, or the other is to lay off staff, which, which clerks have done in past years 
all across the state. And of course, that's not a good situation. But I would just want to make sure, you know, that we differentiate between a one-time help situation due to severe needs of the, of the clerk versus any type of commitment to ongoing funding of court operations, which is clearly not a county responsibility. While it's something you may choose to do, uh, it, you know, it's a court function, a state function, not a county function. So I just wanted to make sure that you're aware of the background in this as you're making decisions. Mr. Melton, oh. okay, I would disagree slightly only with what you said. I was in the legislature, in the mm -hmm. Senate, when we passed the Article 5 revision, uh -huh. and I can tell you that the clerks were horribly funded before we did this and remained horribly funded yeah. afterwards. Okay. Um, so the legislature, for whatever reason, has simply not placed a priority on funding of the clerks of court. I agree with you, it is a state responsibility, okay. but it doesn't all come. I think the clerks were supportive of that change because they hoped that it would result in greater funding. And there was horrible funding before and it remains horribly. It is a state function and they have never lived up to it. County Administrator, you wanted to comment? Yes, and I also just wanted to say what I think, um, it's you know, generally speaking in Broward County, we've, you know, we've not been that uh, cold hearted at, to not, I mean, to allow something to deteriorate to this point. But w one of the situations, that I think we're all facing is COVID. So when you think about um, courts been shut down for you know almost a year, um, a lot of the you know traffic people stopped driving, not a lot of cars, not a lot of tickets, a lot of the, the income that the state assumed that would be there for um, uh, clerks around the state, they were all sort of hit, and 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 um, and they, and quite frankly. This has been county's concern um, for many, many years, is that the way that they get out of performing their, their responsibilities, not clerk the state, is that we'll just starve them and the counties will just jump in because these large urban counties can't afford not to function. So um, we will work very uh, closely with the clerk. Um, to work through this transition, we'll look at those IT issues. I mean, we're we're just as concerned about that as well. This comes back as part of the overall budget um, that we will bring back to the board um, with those things that where we can share resources with the county, we will look to do that. Where we can't, um, um, and it makes sense not to, uh, we'll bring specific recommendations back to you for okay. funding. Mr. Furr, I'm sorry, I've got a list here. Um, uh, if administration is done, this is the order I saw names in. Commissioner Honus, Dr. Sharif, Commissioner Bogan, Commissioner Furr, Senator Rich. Um, Commissioner Fisher, okay. And uh, we're, we're invoking the rule, everybody will speak. Uh, Vice Mayor Udine and I will speak last. Okay, uh, Commissioner Honus, you're recognized, sir. And this is for comments, questions, debate, anything else? Thank you, Madam Clerk and your support staff. Good morning. Thank you for your presentation. Oh my God, I didn't know you were in such bad shape. This is horrible. I mean, it's ridiculous that you are in the position you are in. And you know a lot of folks blame you for not having the money and the resources. They wanna say it's management issue. It's just like blaming poor people for being poor. They never had the resources. They never, never had the, 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 the opportunities. And yet, we say they are the reason they are poor. This is what I find here this morning. And to the to legal counsel, could you give us a breakdown again, uh, refresh me on, on how that allocation of cost uh, a third, a third, or, or something to that. Would you, Ma would please you? return to the dais and you're recognized. Commissioner, is your question, how does the cost allocation assist? You, you, you mentioned that uh, other clerk's office get revenues from the state and from different, different areas. What are they again? 
Yes, sir. So the other clerks receive Article 5 funding, and that's mm -hmm. courtside funding. So mm -hmm. that would be funding, for example, that pays for um, a docket clerk in our felony division. Mm -hmm. And then for the clerks that have um, the official records, which is uh, you were, we're, we're, we are one of the only ones that don't, um, they would also be able to spread their administrative costs. For example, the clerk's salary, my salary, um, another HR, IT throughout um, the multiple agencies. And so that alleviates the strain on Article 5 funding. Did I answer your question? Yeah, well, well, pretty much. I, I thought you said it was a third source that... Uh the Board of County Commissioners, to the extent that, that the, um, the clerk also supports uh, the board and has all of the, the functions that are outlined in Amendment 10. Okay. So if you were to take over fully every function that a clerk would have, you would have revenues coming in from the recording fees, uh, you'd have uh, the interest on the money would be retained by the clerk's office, where would that money go? If the clerk, the clerk as the um, custodian of funds, yes, sir, the custodian of funds is is the watchdog essentially. I, I believe that that's the way the other clerk's offices um, characterize it, or the clerks' association. They're the watchdog to make sure that that the the spending is correct. But ultimately, it's it's the board's decision as to how the money is spent. Okay, Senator uh, Smith. I think the question you're asking is the earlier part when she talked about the third, um, and it's kind of what uh, Mr. Melton said, because in other counties, the clerks performs a lot of the functions that the county has, and that's what the constitutional amendment did was give her all those duties. So other counties, the clerk gets part of the salary from the county because it's, she's the clerk is the county's clerk. They get another part from the recordings part portion, and that's the portion that we're discussing today. And the third part is from Article 5. So those were the three sources, the recording, the Board of County Commissioners, and the um, Article 5. But because we negotiated with the county, that first portion we wouldn't be asking for because she would not be the clerk of you guys. But the recording part is the, the second leg on that um, stool. Is that what we're discussing today? All right. Thank you for your clarification. Also, uh, yes, Senator, uh, our legal counsel or someone, you mentioned the clerk's salary, but you mean the staff of the clerk's office across the board, not just the clerk and, 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 and certain. It, it would be anyone who is touching on anything that would you'd get some subsidy or some spread of cost. It would be the administrative staff. Okay. So the not staff. not the, the strictly court side employees. For example, okay. a felony clerk who's docketing um, okay. filings. Okay. Just so the all the administrative staff above the ones that deal directly with a court filing, pretty much. Correct. To the extent that the administrative staff supports both the court side and the recorder side. So your IT division is in, is, is is where it is with with antiquated equipment, because. If we had a system in place where you were getting some resources to help upgrade that because you have these other functions, you would then be able to upgrade the entire system. Uh, is, is that correct, uh, Mr. IT Director? You recognize, uh, all, all speakers are recognized to respond to any questions. That, that is correct. I also want to uh, point something else out uh, on the expenses side that our office has that most other clerks don't have across the state. For example, uh, we have facilities at West, South, North. Typically in other counties, the county provides a circuit for the clerk's office to communicate between those facilities. We pay AT&T for that service today out of the $1.90 fee that we receive. In addition, um, most counties provide a data center, a uh, Category 5 data center for the clerks to house their equipment. In our case, we pay approximately $10,000 a month out of the $1.90 fee to pay for facilities for the data center because it's not provided by the county. So there's a lot of economies of scale that other clerks have that are provided by the county that we have to pay out of the fees that we collect today. Okay, and, and, and what you brought before us this morning is just for you to get to where you can be in a place to functionally take over the responsibilities that we're now laying on you because of uh, correct yes 
I think uh, what really tells the story is the fact that we have uh, over 400 computers that are between 10 and 14 years old. This creates a ripple effect that I really don't want to discuss in public because it creates a security uh, concern for the office as well as for the other justice agencies that connect to the Clark's uh, networks as well. Uh, this old technology poses a security risk for any data that you're storing on it. So I think that there's an immediate need to really start replacing these old systems and bringing them up to date. And I think this is all has been as a result of the fact that that uh, out of those three revenue sources that were spoken about, we only have one. So the end result is cut back on upgrading equipment, cut back on staff to try to meet the yearly budgets for a long period of time. And when we're talking about bringing county recordings over, um, uh, this network would have to be beefed up and the security would have to be beefed up before you can introduce a new system like that to the environment. And, and let me ask you, if we don't start on this pathway now, what will happen when the actual transfer occurs? Can that happen? Where, where will we be? From my perspective, no. Uh, my position would be that uh, it's you're introducing a, an entire new system that has uh, millions of records, um, and that just increases the, the security concern for all. Um, uh, not to mention that the clerk's records today, um, uh, on average, we receive you know 21 million pages per year. Another point that I wanted to make is that what has happened throughout the years as well is, for example, in 2013, the clerk's office went with electronic court filings. Thank God for that, because otherwise, during COVID, you would have still been on a paper environment with judges working remotely and attorneys working remotely. If you had a paper file, there would have been no way to share that information. But that resulted in an additional expense for the clerk's office and a savings for the county because now where those electronic records are being maintained in systems, the old paper workers are maintaining warehouses that were provided by county facilities. So there's been a shift in expenses from one side to the other over the years as well. Now, I supported us negotiating with the clerk's office to retain some of the functions that we have. And, and, and Madam Clerk, thank you for your support for being collaborative in the efforts to uh, create the, effic the efficiency in government that I think we will have as a result of the county side retaining um, some of these functions. Uh, I, I think it makes it seamless uh, for us to do it here uh, and for you to do the other portion of it. So I believe that we'll probably have efficiency in our government that will save us money as a result of your negotiation, your kind negotiations with us, not fighting us, not going against what the people already had voted for, for you to take over all these functions, because the people had already handed you these functions. We negotiated and you agreed to work with us to retain certain functions, and I'm grateful that you did that on behalf of our people in Broward County. Now, all these residents are ours that go through the court system, whatever it is, when there's inefficiency and there's difficulties and hardship, it's affecting the people of Broward County. So we have to be mindful of that. I understand the budgetary concerns, uh, and, and, and we don't want to necessarily go beyond uh, reasonable budgets, but I don't believe it's unreasonable for us to help stabilize and ensure that the clerk's office function well for the people that we represent here in Broad County. So I'm in full support of giving the clerk what she needs to make the transitions, to function fully, and to upgrade the system that serves our people. Thank you. Are you done, Commissioner? Yes, I'm done. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sharif, followed by Commissioner Bogan. Dr. Sharif, you recognize me. Thank you, Mayor. So my first question is to the county administrator. Can you please tell me how much revenue the county ha is going to lose as a result of turning this function over to the clerk of court? So um, we estimate that it's about 4.4 million uh, net um, when you look at, and this is this, just the recording function, mm -hmm. and, and we believe um, without getting into negotiations and the like, um, if you're limited just to that, to the recording function, the net 
of what it costs to to provide the service and the income that is generated from it is about 4.4. Okay, can, can uh, Mr. Melton, you may, have may I add something? That, that is uh, up for negotiations. There's various ways that this can be structured, uh, either that the county would retain the fees and, and, and provide the budget to uh, make the collections and the function, or uh, the clerk would get more of the fees. That is something in my mind that's up for negotiation with clerk's office. Well, so my basic question, I wanted a number. I would like a number that this represents in terms of a loss or a gain for the county, whatever it is. I know it's a loss because they're taking over the recording function, which is something that we were doing. And um, did we have any, do you have somebody from our staff that can speak to, or if you would like to speak to it, Ms. Henry, so the, the rest the, of it? The number that we've been sharing with to our Your mic is not on. The, the number that we've been sharing with you for the last couple of years is that on that specific function, I mean, we're not talking about the whole, everything that was, was there, but that specific function is about a net to us about 4.4 million. And the assumption is that the clerk would take, as the clerk takes on those new responsibilities, they would have to hire people. And so it could be, it could be more, it could be less, depending upon what she pays her people and, and how she, she chooses to provide their function. And as far as the fees that are collected as a result of these recordings, those fees are set, set on the state level, so those fees can't be changed individually per county? Um, I don't know if that's 100% uh, true. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them are, I just, I'd have to. Can I ask that question of somebody? I that don't know if we know. No, oh, Norm is coming. Okay, Mr. Foster, would you care to, Come Mr. Foster? Oh, Mr. Foster, if you're gonna say anything, we need it from a mic. Oh, I'm sorry, or, attorney. Or, Anika? Anika. Yes, Anyone? The, the majority of the recording fees are set out specifically in statute, um, and they'd just be collecting those. Okay, thank you for that answer. And then, um, so, as this bill was drafted and it was going through the process, we talked about that there would be some cost to make this conversion. And part of the negotiation included, well, if the clerk of courts wanted this um, function, then they would have to be able to roll into their budget whatever needs that they had um, to include this function in their daily operations. Is that not correct? Did we not? Um, negotiate that too? I'm sorry, I missed a portion of your, your... So when we were in this process of going back and forth with this um, item transfer, did we not take into consideration that there would be some type of um, expenditure that the court would have to outlay Absolutely. For, for this? Yep. Okay. And then my next question is, um, what is the current amount that's budgeted at this time for IT in the clerk of court's office. Anyone from the clerk's office is welcome to respond. Does anyone know? I don't have the exact numbers. I think that our, our uh, estimated expenditures are around close to five million, um, and we're currently around uh, two point five million in the red for the end of the fiscal year. So that's not what I asked. So, if you have a, a office and you have a company or you have a business, when you are running your business, there is a certain amount of depreciation and value that is given to equipment that you have in your business. When you have a budget and you have an office that produces that, they take that depreciation of that equipment into account as your yearly budget is coming out, and therefore they budget when you need to replace that equipment. What I'm finding problematic with this statement and this whole dialogue is that we have a clerk of court's office that's being run, and for over 14 years nobody budgeted to replace a computer in terms of depreciation, 
which is a normal budget function and a normal operational procedure in corporate America. Do you not dis do you disagree? Okay. So <laughs> Um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, for us to be. I, I, I just I'm think sorry. just one, one, one point of clarification. I'm just laughing. Just one point of clarification. Somebody um, help me. Shh, but, excuse me. I'm okay. sorry. The state, County Administrator, please. The state of Florida, <laughs> uh, if you, w what type of financial structure do we have? Generally speaking, we are modified accrual, but we function as cash. So unlike businesses, um, the, the, what the clerk has been suffering with is a lack of cash. So she could depreciate it, but if she's not getting any cash, she can't spend. So, so the issue that I think what you're saying is that the state should have recognized that they needed to give the clerk sufficient funds to replace their equipment, mm -hmm. but this is Tallahassee, they didn't do it. Oh. But the thing is, is that at this point, that's not a county problem. I'm just saying, that is not our problem. We have so much stuff that, we, that comes before us that we're trying to fund. I'm looking at this amount of $3.4 million, and I'm thinking about my, the items for affordable housing and the items for homelessness that we're trying to fund this year. And I'm saying, if you want this function, and you know it's gonna cost you some money, and they've given you to the year of 2024 to get it together to do it, then you would need to budget to roll this function into your operations versus coming to the county commission and asking us to fund it, and then saying that this is the starting point, and I see this as a possibility of getting out of control. And so I have items that I think are necessary to move this county forward, and one of those is affordable housing. And we've been on that topic for a very long time, and I'd just hate for us to be taking money from that um, and, and losing out on that opportunity to address that, especially with the looming crisis of evictions and foreclosures as a result of COVID-19. And so the point that I'm getting at is that this processing system here is going to be helping to process those things there. And I would hate to be funding this and not funding that and having people getting evicted, people getting foreclosed on, speeding up that process and then not allocating enough funding to handle what we have to handle. I think that this needs to go back to the state. They put this on, they started this, they wanted to change the way that things operate. Okay, now state, fund the clerk of the courts to do the transition. And um, if this is a starting point, where does it end? And then my, my last question, Ms. Henry, is that I would like a real breakdown of what it costs to do this recording function. The numbers of 50 personnel and 41 personnel, that seems quite high to me to run an IT department. I mean, some of this stuff just doesn't really correlate for me, and I feel like before I make a decision on a budgetary matter like this, I need the um, breakdown of it, and I need to be able to see that. What I asked for today when Mr. Nardo was speaking was because I had not received this breakdown of information, and as I look at it, I think it needs to be further analyzed. And so that's my opinion at this point. And I'm not willing to include this as a budget item right now because I don't believe it's our responsibility. Thank and Dr. you. Dr. Sharif, my understanding as per our initial discussion is we are only having a discussion today and then between now and August we'll, we'll get a recommendation. And with right. your request to the county administrator or the county auditor? Uh, all of them. I want to make my point very clear and I, wanna, I want this clarified for me going forward. As a commissioner, I don't want to vote to include that in our budget if it is not a county function and until I know that these positions are necessary and what they're supposed to be doing. And then I want accountability so that this doesn't come back to us every year for a reoccurring expense because I don't think we need to fund this every year because it is not our responsibility. Thank you, Dr. Sharif, County Administrator. First a question, are we voting on anything today? No. I didn't think so, okay. No. Did you want to? 
Okay. She's asking for our opinion, so I'm giving okay. my okay. opinion. Yes, ma'am. And um, County Ministry, did you, I saw your mic on. Did you also wish no, to I respond? No, I just, um, um, what okay. I am, um, what I wanted to once again to point out um, is that, and I think we're all in agreement that um, that this change um, in the Constitution, the change in the Constitution that was approved, um, and the subsequent local bill that the clerk work, uh, the clerk and, and her staff work with us on, there will be a dichotomy. There will be uh, a, uh, responsibilities that the county will retain, responsibilities that the clerk will uh, assume. The revenue and uh, and and the the costs and and um, the best approach to make sure that this happens seamlessly. Um, both sides have agreed that we need to work on that. So as we said earlier, there's two teams. She has a team. Our team. Our teams will be working together um, in some preliminary conversations. Um, you know, the, the clerk's office um, seem to be amenable to working with our IT to figure out where it makes sense for there to be a collaboration. It won't be in total because a lot of what the clerk does is outside the realm of county government. It's, it's, it, it is truly in that Article 5 arena. But we certainly want, wouldn't want the recording function to be at risk, at risk because of an inadequate whatever. And I would also ask that we stop talking about the IT um, function at this point because Again, we, um, we want to work with them, and, and I don't want to have too much in the record about what the state of their, their IT is. We're going to work with the clerk to make sure that our assets are protected. Okay, thank you. Dr. Shreve, are you done, ma'am? Yes, I'm finished. Thank you. All right, following list, uh, Commissioner Bogan, followed by Commissioner Furr, followed by Senator Rich. Followed by Commissioner Fitch, Fisher, followed by the Vice Mayor, followed by me, followed by round two for Commissioner Holness. Um, Commissioner Bogan, you recognize, and by the way, the chances of our finishing at noon are no longer existent. Uh, Commissioner Bogan, you recognize, sir. Thank you, Mayor. I think it's important that we remember one thing. We need to have a, a clerk's office that can operate efficiently for yes. our residents. That's the most important thing, and I think that's what our clerk wants and with her staff, so she could be staffed to a level and have the ability to function competently and efficiently. And that's what I think is important. And, um, and I think that's what we need to make sure we strive for. If we could do things collaboratively, I think that's great. But, um, you know, I, I, I just, um, as a individual commissioner, I'm going to support if there are need, the needs to make sure that office can function effectively and efficiently. I don't run a clerk's office, so I don't know all the needs that she has, and, but I certainly want to support the office so they can, you know, if they're going to say, hey, we don't have enough people to process stuff for our residents, that's a problem. And so I just, or for whatever needs they may have. I just wanted to ask one question, if I could, of the gentleman that was up. Uh, the technology yes. person, sir? Yes. Uh, sir, if you can please return to the podium. <clears throat> and you're recognized to respond. Just a simple question. So you have 17 unfilled positions right now, correct? Correct. How long has that been going on? Um, probably since 2012. Over the years, just positions they became vacant, not filled because the budget was not there to support. So sometimes positions aren't filled because you're able to do other things more efficiently through technology, or sometimes the position's not filled because you don't need that position anymore. You know, I, I, what my question would be is, um, you know, obviously you have a functioning clerk's office, and you right. know, uh, I haven't heard complaints uh, as a commissioner. I haven't heard complaints. Hey, we can't get anything out of the clerk's office. I haven't heard complaints at all about you. So, which is a good thing. But if you're short staffed, that, that's where I think you hear complaints. So, of course, I support your needs to operate efficiently. I was just curious if you've gone. Um, nearly nine years without we, filling those positions, we, we did, uh, why some, all of a sudden do you need to fill those? We did layoffs, uh, um, some layoffs initially back in 2017 uh, because of uh, budget issues as well. Um, but the bottom line is as, as every year can buy and you're looking at uh, new state mandates 
coming in that require technology, then you're forced to either uh, you're forced to cut back somewhere uh, in order to meet those state mandates and to make sure that you don't hear about the clerk's office not being able to provide some function. So the way that we survived was basically cutting back on positions and cutting back on technology. And, and that's how we've been able to maintain uh, keeping up with state mandates and making um, information available to the public through the clerk's website. Thank you. Okay. I, again, uh, just not to keep repeating myself, I, I do support uh, their requests, <laughs> again, t so long as they, you know, to make their office so they can operate for our residents, you know, and um, if, you know, and so that's, you know, I don't know, I, you know, I certainly have never run an office and I certainly can't say how many positions they need, but I hope that our administration will take into account their needs. I appreciate that. Are you done, Commissioner? I'm done. Thank you, Commissioner Bogan. Uh, Commissioner uh, Furr, you're recognized, okay. sir. I'll be brief. Um, this is, for the most part, hasn't been in our purview. We're kind of flying blind here. To be honest, I, I, I really just want this to be put in your hands and, and I want the auditors to be part of this because I think your background on this is valuable. Um, and I, th I think if the, with the um, negotiations or, or discussions, you all will be able to figure this out. I think from our point of view, what we want to do is see how the, the transition, uh, how it's going to be phased in, how the money's going to be phased in. I mean, one of the, if we're going to phase it in, maybe we do the equipment on the early side so that, that is, they're able to, to operate <laughs> you know, early, and, what, and when we're doing the employment part, obviously there may be jobs that transition over to there. It would make sense, right? The people that are working now doing the job here would probably want, you know, but that's instead of hiring a bunch of people there, and then all of a sudden these, those people that are doing the job now wouldn't be able to go there. That, there has to be a plan here. So we, we, this doesn't make, uh, this makes sense for you all to be doing, figuring okay. this out. Okay. This yeah. is an administrative function not from the policy side. So my, my suggestion is let them, let, let you all do your work. But my, my main, I really want to see all three of um, the, the clerk as well as, as both auditor and county admin working together on this. Are you That's done, it. Commissioner? Yep. Thank you, Commissioner. First, Senator Rich, you're recognized, ma'am. I want to know if you were looking over at my notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Commissioner Furr, were you plagiarizing? <laughs> I just want to say that I, I am in support of, uh, of working with, collaborating, negotiating with the, um, with the clerk of the court. Uh, I, I don't think this is the right place to do it, and I don't believe we have the right information at the moment. So I really agree totally with uh, what Commissioner Furr has said. Um, I do just want to ask uh, Senator Smith a question. Um, Senator. And this may have nothing to do with this, but there was a Supreme Court decision the other day about reporting and did, uh, did, uh, um, did, 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 did actions from uh, reports because there's a, a, a whole backup all over the state with the clerks on this. And it's been taken now where, where it's, now it's going where it's supposed to be going according to the Supreme Court, which is or the judges that have the responsibility for doing this and the attorneys. So does that have anything to do with uh, the needs or workflow of the uh, of the court that's being included, a clerk, a clerk of the courts that's being included in here that would no longer be relevant? Senator, uh, Senator Smith, Senator Geller authorizes you to respond to the question yeah. from Senator Rich. We have a senator trifecta. We have a minority leader trifecta. Yeah, actually, that's right. <laughs> All three of us are minority leaders. Um, senator Smith. Uh, senator. Uh, Commissioner, there, this has nothing to do with that. I think uh, Commissioner Furr made the point. This is dealing with the recording function yeah. that because of that constitutional amendment that brought us here today and the negotiations to only take the recording, as Commissioner Furr uh, just mentioned, is better to put the equipment on the front end so that when we take in those recording functions, it's a seamless transition. And that's what this request is about today, is to make sure we have the equipment and the IT technology so that when there is a transfer, it's a seamless transfer. The functions that you're mentioning, um, that's part of the clerk's issues right now. 
um, that we're dealing with on the budget side. We'd love to get some help on that. But the request today well, it, is so we can have that seamless transition on the recording side. Actually, what the what the what the what the, what the article I yeah. read said that it it actually will no longer that particular re function will no longer be uh, the responsibility of the clerk's mm -hmm. office. So that's why I wondered if it had okay. anything. And you're saying it's basically not a no. Part this of is that. It's totally separate. Yes, ma'am. This is the stuff that we're okay. having to take so, over from so the county. My, my, so then my recommendation is that you know that uh, we go ahead and move this over to where I think it belongs, which is with the administrator and the auditor and the attorney and similar people on the clerk side to come up with uh, what an appropriate figure would be uh, for us to be collaborating with the clerk of the courts. Senator Rich, were you done, ma'am? Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Fisher, you're recognized, sir, followed by Vice Mayor Udine. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And uh, sometimes when you're on the tail end, a lot of questions are asked. I'm answered and, and comments are made. But I don't believe this is recurring costs, is it? Yes, some of it is. Okay. Some of it is. Okay. All right. I mean, we've heard, and obviously the responsibility of the recorded functions is a county function. It will be a county function like we're doing today, which we're receiving the $4 million in fees that will eventually obviously be tailored off. You know, I think we've heard that uh, from Ms. Henry that the clerk deals with a lack of cash. That's why they're here, I think. Uh, and even we can complain about the state of Florida and they're not funding. We want them to fund, but the reality is they're not. So we have to be able to work in good faith. And I, and I have every faith in Ms. Henry and her administration and with the clerk to work in good faith uh, during the time we come back in August to, to have a solution. Um, but there is an immediate need. Uh, and, and it's a critical need at this point. So whether we have to, and I don't even know if this is an opportunity or not, Ms. Henry, whether we advance some funds with, with some recouping from fees but the money needs to get there so they can get what they need to be done. And I don't know if that is even a possibility, auditor, whether you could, you know, we as a county could advance and then as those fees come in, we can get reimbursed. I don't know what it is. That's even a possibility. But look into that as well. And, uh, and again, I have good faith uh, that we, we will work this out uh, by hopefully next well, August when we hear it again. Thank you. Are you done, Commissioner? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Vice Mayor Udine, you're recognized, sir, followed by me. Just a question to county admin. Isn't the, the recording function that we're transferring, it's self-sufficient, it's paid for by the people who are recording, and there's dollars that we, we're talking about a $4.4 .4 million surplus that's coming in that eventually, once this issue is resolved, will get put over to the clerk's office. That's correct. Yeah. Potentially. So, yeah. Again, it's, it's the, this is what we need to spend time right. negotiating. We know what... Um, you know, some of her asks are, I don't know all of them. Right. Um, I, I, I work with this clerk's office all the time in my day job, like everyone knows. I work with all, all the counties in Florida, and the Broward clerk's office does a very good job with what they're doing as far as the conversion over to electronic filing and all that stuff. But I agree with Commissioner F uh, Furr. This needs to be set out in a plan. Um, as Commissioner Bogan kind of mentioned, when you're 17 employees down for 12 years, there may be, there may not be that need of an employee. A 41 person tech team for that office, just to me, seems very high, but I've never run a clerk's office, but I, I would need to see all this through county admin when it comes back in our budget in August. There's gotta be a plan in place. I understand what the clerk's saying and I, in a way kind of agree with it. Some of these dollars that are going to accrue over those recording fees are going to be used to offset the lack of funding because certain things can be pushed into that category, certain administrative costs. I have no problem with that. I just want to make sure that residents, taxpayers, and users that are using this system are getting the most efficient bang for their buck. And this is not a clerk issue. This is in general we have these county constitutional officers and everyone has an IT department. Everyone has this department. Everyone has that department. And it's really not good for the ultimate users. And I've said this before in our budget meetings. There's no reason why this clerk's office should have a 41 person tech department. That's probably higher than most large companies that are paying the taxes into Broward County to work their, their businesses. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Are you done, sir? Yes. Okay. 
Um, well, since everyone, I'll add you to the list, Senator Rich, after Commissioner Honus. Um, the, um, everyone has now spoken, except, so I will conclude on round one. We will then go to round two, Commissioner Honus and Senator Rich. Um, the, my understanding from county administration, from what I've been reading, is there is a cash crunch at the clerk's office, which has been caused by uh, COVID and also caused by, uh, as I say COVID, a lack of fi court filings. Um, I, from everything I've read, there's going now, or has already been, a surge of filings to make up for that period. So I think that you will um, have a period where you will catch up and make up for the funds that were lost. Um, there will be a loss of revenue. There's also, as the county administrator said, a loss of expenses for some of these items. Having said all of this, I do think that there it is appropriate for there to be a one-time cash infusion of some amount, but we, we're not voting on anything today. We're not going to know we need to have a complete ask from the clerk. And as has been said, I think that the best way of coming up with that appropriate number is for the auditor, the administrator, and the clerk to all get together, sit down. I'm, you know, I don't think we give anybody that's asking for a lot of new money everything they ask for. But I think that if people of good faith sit down together with the clerk, the administrator, and the auditor, I'm sure we will be able to find a one-time cash infusion. I would not be supportive, uh, Administrator. You said that there were some requests for ongoing permanent. This is an Article 5 issue. I would not be supportive of permanent funding from the county. Um, it, do I believe the clerk's office will be systematically underfunded? Yes, I do. Do I believe that almost every clerk's office in the state is systematically underfunded? Yes, I believe that also. For reasons I have never understood, the state simply shirks its duty on funding the, the clerk's offices properly, but that is a function of the state, as are they not funding the judges or the PD's office appropriately either. But I do think, considering the transition, that you need funds for that transition. So I think that uh, I've heard at least some broad agreement here, probably not supportive of permanent funding, but probably supportive of one-time funding at an amount to be negotiated. And since we're not voting today anyhow, um, please work it out and try and reach an agreement that you can come to us with in August when we will be fun, when we will be voting. Uh, that concludes my remarks. We will now call on Commissioner Honus, followed by Senator Rich. Commissioner Honus, you're recognized, sir. Uh, Madam Clerk Foreman, would you... Uh... Okay, please return to the um, dais. And, 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 and any of your other staff that may need to help with answering these questions, and probably a technology person especially. In the process of transition, you will need continuous staffing to work that transition, am I correct? That is correct. So you'll need technology people to be working to build out this new technology to get you to where you can transition seamlessly from us to you, correct? Absolutely. Is there anything you want to add uh, in terms of how do we transition and, 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 and personnel? Because I know you will need personnel to put in place to implement the technology and the interface that we need to have in order to uh, transition to you going forward. So for the, I mean, at minimum, we must have continual funding, ongoing funding, not just this one time, and then what happens to the personnel that are in place to implement this? Did we fire them? Yeah, uh, we don't know what we don't know. There's, uh, we haven't had an opportunity to meet with the county right. to identify the specifics about the technology that's supporting county records today. Um, my guess, 
would be that the county's IT department, at a minimum, provides infrastructure support for county recordings, and that the 51 staff that you have in county recordings are not dedicated to IT. You may have a, a couple of individuals that are IT related, but those roles would be specifically to maintaining the application layer and not the network layers and, and, and systems that we're talking about. I think that that function uh, is probably supported by uh, county's uh, uh, IT department and not county records. So we'll have to look at that and look at, um, is there equipment coming over? Um, uh, do we have to build uh, network infrastructures, uh, uh, interfaces to uh, recording agencies uh, that might have interfaces with that system? Is the system coming over? These details will be part of that transition process. And the more we learn, the more we'll understand what the actual requirements are uh, for the transition process. But at this point in time, what you're asking for is the bare minimum for you to be able to get to uh, some sense of functionality at this point to start in time, the process. Yeah, we know that at, at some point, that system will be part of our network. So what we're asking for is we're asking to uh, uh, upgrade that network infrastructure to make sure that it's secure and stable before we introduce the system into the environment. And that will require staff. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Madam Clerk, I want to thank you for your good faith in working with us over the past couple of years for us to transition. You could have stood against the county and says, I'm going to take it all. But instead, you, Senator Simmet, and your staff decided to work with us to create this transition for the benefit of the people of Brown County. And I want to thank you on behalf of all the people of Brown County You're welcome. for your collaborative efforts. Is there anything else you would like to add? I think we have covered everything. Um, Allison, on the legal side, um, I think we covered a lot. Um, Diane Diaz has been with the office for more than 30 some plus years and she's been through four clerks and she's seen the ins and out of what the organization has gone through as far as the money is concerned. Yes, Senator, uh, Mayor Geller, you were there in the Senate, you know what was going on. Mm -hmm. Senator Rich as well. So when I came, became the clerk four years ago, five years ago, I took on a lot of things that needed to be done that was never ever done. So I took on that challenge to start changing and bringing us to the 21st century, which we needed to be. And I will continue to do that because the constituents voted me in to do a job and I will continue to serve the county abroad, but I want to do it in a way where it's a lot efficient for me to serve them. And my technology department has been in the red ever since I took it on. And I have been trying everything from a wing and a prayer to, for us to function. And we have been continuing to do that. Um, but to try to battle the county for something that was given to us, none of us wanted that energy to, to, to go out like that. So we decided to just stick with the county record side. And I do think, um, the county administrator and Representative Jacob um, for working with us to allow us to do that. Again, thank you. Thank you for your service to our people. Thank you. Thanks. Commissioner, are you? I'm done. Okay. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, Senator Rich, and I believe that's yeah. the last. Yeah, I'm just going to clarify because uh, Senator Smith, I wanted to just clarify the Supreme Court ruling, because I, I used the wrong word, it was uh, redaction. And it, the court finalized a new rule that no longer requires the clerks of courts across Florida to be responsible for redacting confidential information from civil court documents. Uh, and uh, the 10-year-old the, the rule obviously had put all of this emphasis on the clerks rather than on the judges and the people who are filing those documents. So there's backup all over the state in all 67 counties. And to do it, it just, sometimes it takes more than two weeks to get a document back or redacted. So I, I have a feeling that somehow that's you know, going to alleviate something in the clerk's office, uh, having nothing to do necessarily with technology. But I just wanted to clarify what that actually was that the Supreme Court did. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Senator Rich. I believe that this concludes the presentation from the office of the county clerk. And we will now return to 
The uh, budget, I think, Mr. Foster, you'll be making the overall um, budget recommendation, sir. Is that correct? I think in conjunction with the county administrator. Okay, you're recognized, sir. He means I'll be jumping in and out. Okay, <laughs> jump away. So we wanted to um, give you a summary of um, where the county administrator is sort of thinking about status of submissions. The item we just talked about does in fact uh, affect the numbers we're gonna show you and part of the main message was this is what it looks like now but things are changing. Um, as, as I sort of alluded to there, the main factors in trying to put together the recommended budget are um, the property appraiser will give us a July 1st certified tax roll. We do, in normal years, it is not much different than the June 1st, but we there, there is um, gonna be a slight change, we think. It may be a non-slight change. Um, we also noted here the clerk of court was coming to present today, and your reaction is very helpful in thinking about how to deal with that issue. But as the county administrator said, there are groups now set up to go through a lot of these technical issues about whether or not the current system that the county uses is something that would be kept or would it be a new system? Would it be the same employees? Uh, and all those issues are gonna affect that transition. And also, uh, as you know, the, uh, the US Treasury Department has issued the interim final rule on the America Rescue Act funding. And we don't expect that to be finalized um, until later in the, the, the fall but some of the backup options on some of the funding items are affected by what might happen there. So we do anticipate, and in fact, after the previous discussion we just had, there will be some refinements to the recommendations in August, um, even from what the county administrator presents on July 15th. Um, what we tried to do here is give you a sense of the items that you talked about at the last budget workshop. Um, you can see them there. Um, affordable housing we'll talk about in some detail. We're looking at a number of funding sources um, to make progress on that issue. So that's on, on the, there are three sort of um, status updates. Um, likely to be recommended at essentially the amounts that were discussed. Amount under study means it may not be the same amount or different funding sources. And further review, there's some issues that have got a, um, just a number of sort of factual things to work through or talk to partners. Yeah, in uh, in many of uh, uh, in these further review, the extent to which we can fund those items out out of the current budget, and there is the ability to do that. I don't want to take them into the next budget year. We just want to get them off the get them off the table. So some of them we know we can do. Some we're looking at. Some might be more appropriate for the federal funding. Some may not. So that's what we're. We just we're sort of working through and, and clearly the size of the ask could also be something that we're that we're concerned about so um, we also refined. gave you um, last time we had the board submissions then we had some other priority issue, priority issues priority issues I apologize that we talked about um, most of these um, they relate to computer security or um, public records requests or things that you've directed us to do before so most of these are in the recommended category at this point. Um, one of the smaller ones on the licensing rights, we're working with the county attorney's office on just exactly can that move forward in that form just to do with some legal language issues. Um, animal care, the, the amount um, is still under discussion and it will depend on what the other items are, what, what can be afforded. Um, I think resilience, um, we're looking to do in the capital budget uh, a review of the county, the generally funded county um, facilities to see how they look for resilience. And so we're trying to figure out what the right amount of money is for that kind of review. Um, and then the, the, the BARC Annex, um, which would, if it went forward, would have some substantial capital costs. And then in future years when it opened operating costs, at this point, we're still looking at it. Uh, there are some other funding sources, potentially the Rescue Act, potentially an opioid settlement that might be possible, and it's it's a little early to, to nail that one down for this budget cycle. Mayor. Yeah. Um, I'm just, or, or, I, I just want to ask, do you want to have the full presentation before I we, was inclined to have the full presentation. Yeah, what What do you all think? We're almost yeah. done. Okay, well, let's do the full presentation, then we'll go back. And, uh, Commissioner Furr, you'll be first name on the list, followed by Senator Rich. Um, there was a couple of other issues that either came out of your discussion on June 8th and even your discussion earlier this week. So um, 
the PACA and cultural grants, we're looking um, to see if we can um, fit those in because they're non-recurring. And again, as the county administrator said, it may be some funding we have left over this year or potentially some of the federal assistance will fit there. Summer Youth was um, dis dis discussed the other day, so we've got that one on as reviewing further. Um, and it could either be money for this summer or potentially next summer as well. Um, County agencies, there were a couple of other small items we just wanted to tell you that weren't on the list last week. Um, FASD, there's a small item to do with data compliance of our payment systems that we are looking at to just ensure that we're in full compliance. Um, there's a couple of positions in human rights to um, process HUD cases. And then there's a solid waste, there's a potential issue to do with um, relocating a pipeline that may have some costs. Um, we don't know that there are costs yet that the county is responsible for, but we want to um, not forget that. On the constitutional officers, um, you had the sheriff in and a request from the sheriff. At this point, um, the, the sheriff did ask for, I think, around $7 million additional um, for dispatch. And at this point, we're looking at um, funding that at perhaps 30, 40, 50 percent of that request level. There has been a number of years where we haven't added much. Um, but we are we are thinking that they are um, they need a little bit more funding, and discussions are still continuing about the actual operations after the Fitch report. On the other one, um, the sheriff's budget request was quite um, fiscally responsible at 2.75 percent. But one of the things is they they really didn't include almost anything for capital funding, which in our world is largely vehicle replacements on the county side, not the city contract side. So we are looking at putting in a few million dollars, three or four million, perhaps for that, because we, we are ultimately responsible for their vehicle purchases and we don't really want a big request three or four years from now. And we have a small item of about two million dollars. We worked with the BSO staff and we, we do some insurance costs for them. We provide and somehow the right amount didn't get in the budget. So we're gonna include that as well. Um, I don't know uh, the supervisor of elections that I don't know whether you received a revised request. We understand there is one coming. Um, and so it's, I think it's supposed to be communicated to you, to the commission. Um, we think it relates to the um, not so much redistricting or re-precincting, but the communication of the new precincts to all the voters next August. So it's about a $900,000 item. And then uh, Clerk of Courts was just here um, talking about um, that issue today. So how, how does this all look if we um, try to put some numbers around it? This is what it looks like, and these numbers are moving hourly. They used to move daily last week, but they're moving hourly this week. Um, so this is kind of where it looks like right now. The revenue change from the budget that you adopted last year is about $70 million. Um, that is more than we anticipated a few months ago, and it's largely due to the um, property appraiser's 5% increase. We had been thinking it might be more in the 2.8, 3%. Of the core budgets, we, we look at all the agency's core budgets and constitutional officers provide us requests. That uses up about 30 million of it, so there's about 40 million. Um, the balance between recurring, I'm speaking first on this chart, recurring revenue and spending, and then the next chart I'll talk about one time. So the county administrator's preliminary recommendations are divided into um, a couple of different thematic areas. Um, affordable housing, which I, I will explain in more detail in a second, five million recurring general fund. Uh, economic development is primarily activities related to the film um, proposal, is about a million bucks a year. Human services is a couple of items, and the total there is around six million at this point, um, but how it will be split is still um, being looked at, but that did include permanent supportive housing and the children's council items and some others. There's a number of other items as well that are just grouped that, are, that you saw on the earlier sheets. And then the constitutional officers are those BSO items um, added up. We um, are also looking to reserve um, some of the issues you were talking about earlier. Uh, we're looking to reserve half a percent equivalent of property taxes, which is about six million dollars um, a year. And I'll return to this because depending on how VAB goes, we may or may not need that during fiscal 22. But we are concerned enough at this point that it's worth putting aside. And related to the discussion you just had, we're 
I'm thinking at this point of reserving $10 million, which was the estimate of what we would um, potentially lose on a separate issue to the constitutional amendment than the one you just talked about, which is the, the creation of a new elected tax collector, which would be in fiscal 25. And we note that if we set aside that amount now, we would be able to use it for non-recurring things in fiscal 22, 23, and 24. Keep that thought in mind, because you'll see it on the next chart. So the non-recurring um, items that we have been discussing and are aware of, um, these, are the, these are they. So the Film Commission, the estimate for a facility would be $10 million. And so at this point, we're thinking of using that first year reserve for the tax collector to fund that in fiscal 22. Um, I think you, a number of you mentioned PACA and cultural grants, um, one-time um, funding for fiscal 22. 500,200, and we think at this point we can look to some of the federal assistance that we've received to make that work. Um, that's our thinking right now. NOVA, I believe, was an additional 1.75 million, and so we do have in the budget a one-time reserve that was for economic development that still has 80, 850,000. So we're looking to use that, and then we need to find 900,000 one-time money from somewhere. Um, waste generation, um, one, one million dollars to be determined. So we've got a few million here on the one-time size that we don't have an obvious um, place to fund them right right now. Potential cost for the pipeline relocation we think is a million and a half if it is a county responsibility, which we're not at all sure yet it is. And there's a few other things. Some of the few other things relate to the one-time costs of some of the recurring items in human services and others. So we think we have um, 12 or 13 of this 15.6 million identified and we'll work to figure out how to cover those um, at this point. Um, so then affordable housing, um, we, we're looking at this point to a number of different funding sources for fiscal 22. And this is kind of where we are right now. We wanted to get your reaction. So the first um, is to provide $5 million from the general fund recurring um, in fiscal 22 and beyond. Um, the discussion we just had regarding the, the clerk, if that does result in some recurring funding in 22, we're going to have to look at all of the recurring. Um, but there was a $5 million um, seemed to fit. Then um, we talked a lot about the 50-50 split of retiring um, CRAs. So for fiscal 22 only, um, we're thinking we could commit, since we have the economic development projects moving with other funding, um, all $7.5 million towards affordable housing. So that would be seven point five million on top of the recurring. And then out of the American Rescue Act, um, commit $12.5 million. So it will bring those first three lines up to $25 million and see if we can get what projects we can get that would use that amount of money or perhaps even more in the, in the next however many months it would take us to, to work with them, that we're certain would be spent within the time frame of the American Rescue Act. And that's with, with housing projects, they really can sometimes take a long time. So that's sort of 25 million from those three sources. Um, we're also looking to, if during fiscal 22, the VAB process does work out um, less unfavorably, if that's the right way to put it, um, that there could potentially be up to six million dollars that could be added. Um, sometime we think February or March we would be reasonably clear of how the VAB appeals go, but that depends on the, the number and the volume and the complexity of those appeals. The other two non-financial points, um, we really would want to prioritize um, proposals from developers that really do get finished and don't have permit issues or don't have big unknown um, partner issues or environmental issues, and so that's just the proof is in the pudding with those. And the last one, um, county ministers especially interested in, um, in the interim final rule process that we talked about, the Chicago Housing Development Authority has actually asked a question about can those funds be used to assemble land parcels uh, where the project might not be done by 2026. So there may or may not be a response to that question in the final rule that might allow us to potentially assemble some sites. But for now, it doesn't look like that's eligible. But, but other people are having the same um, thought um, about that. 
So that would be recurring um, for affordable housing of about 8.75 million, and then also an additional non-recurring in 22 of 16 to potentially 22. So if if the VAB um, was able to be released, it would probably be about just over 30 million in um, fiscal 22 for affordable housing. If um, it would be almost, if it's a little bit more than 30. If if we freed up the VAB. And then the next steps are your reaction today, and then as things um, get nailed down over the next few weeks, we will be preparing a formal um, county administrator's recommended budget for you, which we will present or we will deliver on July 15th. The schedule in August is we currently have two workshops. Um, general fund wrap up, including we will have the county auditor and county uh, attorney's office um, uh, at, the, at one of those events. General capital, um, tourist development taxes, the surtax and transportation capital, and then the enterprise funds, water, wastewater, aviation, and port. We're not sure which um, workshop they'll fit, but uh, and then we will also give you an update on the clerk of court um, at one of those um, workshops. The public hearings, most important thing, 5.01 p.m. on September 9th and 21st. Most important thing, public hearing. And did I mention about how much the cities are getting? No, I forgot. <laughs> did I? I forgot. <laughs> so, one thing. So we're ready for questions? Yes. Okay. All right, uh, let me say two things. Uh, I'll save virtually all of my remarks to everyone else has spoken. just want to first remind you, as you're looking at the affordable housing funding, that Commissioner Furr is working on putting together a plan which will come to the commission. My flag fell down, sorry. Uh, is putting together a pl uh, plan that will come to the commission on how the affordable housing money should be spent. Mm -hmm. So as you're looking at that, please remember that there will be, uh, we'll be getting a uh, presentation, hopefully at our first commission meeting where we decide, for example, how much goes to multifamily, how goes, much goes for homeowner's assistance, how much goes for rehabilitation, all of that. Commissioner Ferg, well, good luck on that. <laughs> News on, to me, but thank you. Well, I, I, well you I volunteered for that, as I, I did, recall. I did. Um, but again, that you'll be doing the draft, but then the commission will all weigh in. And the only other remark I wanted to make is Mr. Foster, um, county administrator, county administrator designate, I'm thrilled with your budget recommendation. Yeah. I just think you all did a really outstanding job, and I wanted to tell all three of you how pleased I am. Uh, any specific comments I have, I will wait until every other commissioner has spoken. So hold on, I have Commissioner Furr. Senator Rich, Commissioner Bogan, Dr. Sharif, um, Vice Mayor Udine, the Commissioner Honus, and I think that's everybody here. Okay, Commissioner Ryan will call in just to comment. Uh, no. uh, Commissioner Furr, you're recognized, sir, followed by Senator Rich. Thank you, and I, uh, I'll echo your thoughts. I thought you, you all did a great job on this. It doesn't, I, I'm not, I have very few things to go over, but a couple. Okay. Um, with regard to the expanding, um, seven, page seven. With regard to uh, expanding communications and service at animal care, I think the most important thing that needs to happen there, and this was in uh, your audit, audit, Mr. Milton, was letting the public know, because I just got a call the other day. Somebody was, was upset about having to pay money to, to get a, a license, a tag. And as soon as I said, do you know where the money, where that money goes? I said, it actually is going to help the, uh, have a no-kill shelter, have these things. And as soon as I was able to explain it, she says, I'll buy it. <laughs> you know, and, but, and, but it's like, but that is not getting through. It is not getting through. And that, it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily cost money. It just means getting it out there. Yeah. And getting, and getting that message out. So my, my, my issue is not the money here. It's okay. getting that message out. Okay. Okay. So. However, however that gets out, um, because I think that's the key to having money come in to support the shelter. Correct? Is that the, what was that the idea of that? Um, and I know we're still trying to figure out if we're doing a, a independent or a third party doing that or not. But 
That's another thing. Um, page eight, with re regarding to summer youth, um, I just reiterate what we said the other day. This, I think, really requires coordination with the CSC because they have various funding sources coming from ELC all over the place. Absolutely. Um, so that just they just need to be on the table. And I think a lot of things will come together on that. Um, with regard to the funding on the vehicles for BSO, my understanding is that the roll, the money that gets rolled over every year is was designated for for vehicles. Okay. Is there is there not enough money being rolled over? Well, I think there's a couple of issues. I think since the recession, it has been the practice that the unspent funds, the BSO would make a request to you to reappropriate it. And we had an agreement, 2015-16, um, something like that, that it would be for one-time items. Um, so it has been a number of things, I think, the last four or five years. Uh, you may have remembered a discussion on helicopters three or four Correct. years ago. I so I think it hasn't been a fixed set of things. But the last few years, I think the sheriff's been quite clear in his priority, which is the new training center. So okay. we have funded the new training center. Um, I think you funded it up to, I believe it's $45 million. Right. Um, and so I think that project may need a few more um, million dollars this fall. So the, the what we're talking about is in their regular operating budget, there, there is a capital section which has tr traditionally been used for vehicles, maybe some IT, things like that. So that's the one we're thinking of um, giving a little bit of money. The, the, the rollover money, um, to the extent you reappropriate, it could be used, but we think for the next year it's probably going to be used for that training project. Okay. And so no, we, we I, think I, we, we in think, my mind that was always right. going toward vehicles. So that we, we, is not the case. In, we, in the past, they have funded yeah, some vehicles. Some, uh, our biggest concern right now, if they haven't, if they haven't really funded a lot of vehicles uh, last year, and then going into another year, at some point, we're going to have this big balloon of requests for okay. replacement vehicles. And as you know, we're trying to push a variety of with electric and, right. and, and all and to right. incentivize them to kind of get moving on some of that as well. Okay. So and I, and I think we just didn't want that big balloon okay. to hit us. Yeah. And to that point, I don't, obviously they don't all have to be our, your normal police vehicle. Like Correct. We talked about. Okay. Uh, um, I should also mention um, it's both law enforcement vehicles and fire. Okay. And so as Commissioner Sharif mentioned earlier, it's, we think it's better to keep replacing them than let them all get old. And so that, okay. that was our thinking there. Okay. Um, I'm, looking, I'm trying to read my own notes here. Um, with regard to the affordable housing, uh, I, I'm, I think this is good, especially if we can use some of the ARP on it. I think what I'd like to include so that we're seeing a, a full picture of it is adding to our total what the money that is going to Hollywood as well, because that's part of that's going to affordable housing. Just add it so we so we have a clear picture of what the total is, as well as what the effect of the impact is with the school board, because that has a that has a dollar amount to it. Yes, it's not money that's going to be able to go directly to. I see Senator Rich is shaking her head on this one, but I do think it is a part of the total picture. Of, of how much is being expended and, and how much we're dedicating to it. I realize this isn't money that gets to developers, but it is a total of what our contribution is. So I just wanted, to, I think it would be worth. So you made one comment that I'm not quite sure I translate. You said okay. something about the school board? The impact fees, when we, when we um, oh, that, expanded okay. that, okay. There, was a, there was a fiscal impact yeah, on that. Okay. And it, the, okay. good, the good part about it is that that means for the those developers don't have to pay as much, which is a good thing. Just let's add all that up so we know what we're doing. That's all. Okay. Um, with regard to the film commission, um, and I, I I I'm not really in, in favor of us going and getting another twenty thousand square foot facility. I really think it's a perfect chance to use the Young at Art Museum for this. Why not? I mean, we've been thinking towards arts. That's, that is a right, perfect size for it. You know, it's got high ceilings. They've got great places for all kinds of equipment. Let's not go spending $10 million where we don't have to when we've got a place where we can do that. That's just me thinking. Um, and those are my comments. Thank you. 
Thank you, Commissioner Furr. I appreciate your remarks. Uh, Senator Rich, you're recognized, ma'am, followed by Commissioner Bogan. I'm not going to be you. shaking my head. Thank you. Yeah. I know. Uh, no, I, unfortunately, I have to be on a call at 12 o'clock, and I've been, like, you know, this has been, <laughs> I didn't think the clerk thing was going to take quite that amount of time. Anyway, um, so le let me just start by, by, by one thing that's come up that um, I believe we'll have to take a position on. Uh, I've spoken with uh, Marty Cassini about it already, uh, Ralph Stone, others. Um, you may recall, we, we put in a bill, we, we helped get a bill filed last time, and it was approved 100% by the Florida Association of Counties, and it was to change the formula of the percentage that is used for single family housing, because originally in the 1992 statute, uh, they, this, that was not in the Constitution, the, the percentages, but the percentage was 65% single family housing. That is utterly out of line today, utterly out of line, and only 35% going to, less than 35% actually going to multifamily of whatever got into the Sadowski Fund. So now there is a constitutional amendment that is being filed by the Board of Realtors. And the original piece of it, when I, when I was called about it yesterday, I said, I need to see the whole thing because I just knew that somewhere in this amendment was going to deal with putting in the Constitution the 65%. And that's exactly what this does. In addition to the good thing about using the money, the, the doc stamp money for affordable housing, unfortunately, and, and as I said, they, we, we had a bill last year and the realtors actually helped kill that bill it was never heard to change that formula to 50-50. And, and especially in a big urban county, this does not work. And all this doesn't fit, one size doesn't fit all counties. So just to say this, it says at least 65% of the funds expended from the state and local government housing trust funds in each fiscal year must address affordable housing access and availability through programs related to purchase, to, to purchase of affordable housing rather than programs related to the rental of affordable housing or other purposes related to affordable housing access and affordability. And I, I, I have to say that this just does not work for any urban county. It may work for a rural county, but not, not for us. And as you recall, we're, we're having an update on the FIU study, and uh, we already know that right now, from the 18 study, 2018, that only 12.7% of people in Broward County can afford to buy a home at what was $360,000, the area, uh, the annual median cost, and now it is over $460,000. So that will go down when you see this study come back. It will even be in the single digits, as my friend Norm uh, mentioned, <laughs> thought the other day when we were talking about this. So this just doesn't work for us. We are now, I am so excited about what our administration is doing and putting together for us here because we know right now that we can come up with about over $30 million worth of developments, multifamily developments that developers, either they, 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 they're shovel ready, they have the land, they have the zoning. There's one in Fort Lauderdale that already has 200, uh, it's a 200 unit uh, 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 project uh, with zoning. And uh, again, if we could get them the money and we're, uh, I know that Bertha's checking with and looking at the American Rescue Plan to see how we can do this, how we can either purchase land or um, it was indicated to me that there is a provision that you can give it to a nonprofit <clears throat> to purchase. So uh, there are ways that we can do this, but right now um, Mr. Stone is putting together a list and it's a pretty robust list of developments that would be shovel ready that we could just get going with them. So that, that part of it for me is, you know, extremely exciting. But this other is gonna, we're gonna have to figure out what to do with this to make, to, you know, so that this does, does, does not occur. Um, I also um, uh, just, you know, wanna thank, uh, uh, everybody is coming together. The business community met with, uh, with Bertha, uh, I believe yesterday. Yesterday. Uh, and they're coming to the table to help us try and find this developers and land and so that we can have this shovel ready uh, for and, and be able to complete these projects by the 2026 deadline, which so we can use the American Rescue Act money uh, and then build up our, our reserve in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund for when that money goes away and more CRA money 
comes into the, you know, into the pot after 2026. So um, I, I, I just think, you know, this, this to me is, is the number one issue in our community. You saw people here the other day getting $13.61 an hour. You know, they can't afford housing. They can't afford to pay rent. They can't afford to buy a house for sure. And, and they, they, you know, it's tough to feed their kids and provide health care. So uh, this, is, this is to me the, the, really the most important critical thing uh, that, we, uh, that we can do. And um, uh, as far as I, the last thing, I just want to mention the, um, the animal care. I, have, I think I've been talking for about three, maybe four years about the fact that we do not communicate to our constituents across the county what this animal care shelter does and the, 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 the opportunities there. So I, I and, and it may, who said it wouldn't cost money? You said it wouldn't cost money. I think Commissioner first said it wouldn't cost money. It may cost some money. It's going to cost some money. It may cost money, and it will cost money. Because we, you know, I look at the Humane Society. I get their information all the time. And they're putting out what they're doing. And people give money because they're excited about what's going on there. And we should feel the same way about our animal shelter. And uh, the only communication people get, unfortunately, are very negative things out there on social media. And we need to counteract that with the good things and the positive things that are happening at our animal shelter. Okay, that's it, Mr. Okay. Mayor. Thank you, um, um, Thank you Senator Rich. Yep. Uh, have you con concluded your remarks? I did. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Commissioner Bogan, you recognized her, followed by the rest of the commission. <laughs> uh, Dr. Sharif is next. I had all my questions answered. I think you did a great job as well. Thank you for all the time and effort and work you put in. Um, Commissioner Rich, congrats. I think it's a great amount of money we're putting into affordable housing, and I'm supportive of it. And, uh, and uh, thank you. That's it, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner Bogan. Uh, Dr. Sharif is not present, so we will get back to her as soon as she gets back. Uh, Commissioner Vice Mayor Udine, you're recognized, sir. <coughs> Thank you. I'm going to be very brief. I think that it's a very well done budget. Um, I'm, I'm happy with what's in there with affordable housing. I know that staff has heard everything. I had my meeting with the Broward workshop yesterday. I was lucky enough to go after birth that spoke to them in the morning, so it was a little bit easier. But I will point out, and this is just a commentary because I made it on the call, not everyone's paying their employees the type of wages even that we're starting to pay now as the discussions that we're making. So the private sector needs to step up here and as Commissioner uh, Senator Rich mentioned, you need to start paying employees more if that's what's going to take to get more employees to come work for you. That's my soapbox on that one issue. My two issues on the budget, um, first thing is um, you have on page seven with computer security, is that the enhanced security? I don't want to get too far in detail, but the different companies that are coming in with the cybersecurity defense and whatnot, like Microsoft and some of the carriers. So we have, uh, it's a multi-prong, that's, you know, it's, yep. it's part of the overall, and it's a, the part of the overall strategy okay. that we'll have. And the second thing is, the, the, where are the dollars in there for the video thing that we had talked about for the dispatchers? That's somewhere else maybe in the P25 budget. I want to just make sure that we can be one of the first ones to roll out this new technology. It's in the capital budget. It's in the capital budget. It's in the like capital budget. I don't care if it's carbine or not, but I just want somebody to do this because I think, our, I think it's going to be a major public safety enhancement. Yes, sir. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are you done, Vice Mayor? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sharif, uh, you weren't here, so it back up to you now, ma'am. You're recognized, ma'am. Thanks. Um, first of all, Norm, I'm always asking you to find the money, and I think you've done that. <laughs> you and Ms. Henry always work very well together. So um, I appreciate um, what you've done here. Um, I had a couple of questions. I know that um, uh, Commissioner Furr was supposed to come back with something for affordable housing, right? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, yes, ma'am. We, so, we did um, that at the last meeting. Yeah, I know. I, was here, I heard that, but I wanted to know when are we going to get the draft of that so that we can kind of answer some of the questions in regards to the permanent supportive housing? What, what, when should I expect that? Three o'clock today, ma'am. Yeah. Five o'clock. <laughs> Five o'clock today? Yeah. yeah. No, I was joking. This is yes, exactly. That's a joke. 
Th this, this is going to take a while. Okay. So, to, for us to, to kind of, because I, I really need to work with Senator Rich somehow. You, can, you can't. I know. So somehow we're going to have to. You can't sunshine. Because really, cause sunshine. really, cause really right. what we're trying to do is figure out how do you spread it out you know, with, with exactly what she was talking about. Right. How much would go to owner occupied? How right. many can go to different kind of things? So, so I, uh, I'm probably have to, I'll, I can either work so with. So can't we do what we did before? Say so sometimes when we had issues in the past as a county commission body, we had work, uh, uh, individual work groups. Yeah. And we could sunshine those meetings and have them here in the county. I mean, we used to have them yeah, we could do over there on the third floor, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and that might or be a good 30, but I think that because we all have these things that we want to work through, if we could just sunshine a work group and uh, commissioners could be invited to attend or not, and it's not a workshop, but it's just a work group or a subcommittee for a specific issue, and we, we plan it for a specific time and that's it. Because I think we're going to need to, much to what Senator Rich, Rich was talking about, we need to know what developers are already in line. Correct. What, what projects are already in the... And then kind of back, back, you know, reverse engineer from there, how much do we have left, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. So just, I, I, I just I'll, wanted I'll to participate because I, I have been asking about this, and I know that um, Senator Rich had been on the front lines of affordable housing for a long time, and we kind of just kind of stepped I, I just back. got volunteered on and this. And then so. Beam all of a sudden got volunteered, <laughs> Somehow I got volunteered for it. On this. So I figured, you know, why not throw my uh, two cents in for whatever that's worth. So if I can be involved in, I'm sorry? Golden boy, you're back. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, if I can be involved in that um, housing work group, that would be great. And then, as far as the item for the um, summer for the kids, I I am going to be here. So, um, if you could please keep me in the loop on what that looks like. I know we had talked about the C CSC, CSC um, getting involved but I wanna make sure that the funding is allocated to the programs that I'm specifically addressing. I know they have some programs, but I don't think that they are as um, thorough in terms of incorporating what I'm specifically asking to address in this particular youth. Um, the kids that are um, in some way tied to the juvenile justice system. And those who are not, but that wanna participate Chris in this program. Okay. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharif. And Dr. Sharif, in response to your question, I'll circulate something. Uh, I, my plan had been that we would give Commissioner uh, Fur the first shot, and then we would look at it in August. But if you'd prefer, I'll send something to all of the commissioners asking if there's any time in July or August that everybody's in town that they'd like to hold a workshop on this. So I will send that out. Not every commissioner has yeah, to attend. Not I a just workshop. Because make... when we term it workshop, and, and then people from the general public see it, some of them say, oh, you're missing from that workshop. And they don't understand the process of the behind the scenes for a workshop. I get my, you get your information ahead right. of time. You can choose to come if you need further or you want to hear the discussion. But for a, um, a work group, like we had these, these I, work I, groups. I understand. I want one for film. Right. So that you and I can communicate in a place that's sunshined. Mm -hmm. And I think I would like to be included on the work group for housing so that I can communicate with them because I think it makes for more efficient government. If we can communicate ahead of time, we don't have to spend so much time hashing it out here. Absolutely. Um, I frequently feel that the Sunshine Law, unfortunately, while has all sorts of good things, really pro inhibits a lot of the ability right. to, to work effectively. So all that's right. it for me. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Commissioner Honus, followed by Commissioner Fisher. Commissioner Honus, you recognize, sir. Norm, you're a rock, a rock star. Uh, and, and I know you're going to go in the entertainment business uh, afterwards, mm -hmm. <laughs> after you I, retire. I sincerely doubt that. <laughs> I see him as a punk rocker. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I saw him uh, as John Denver, like, <laughs> but uh, with those glasses. The uh, BSO vehicles that we're looking to uh, buy, those are the ones that 
service the airport, the seaport, the BMSD? What, what, no, what these, vehicles are these? These are um, these are the uh, regional vehicles. Um, the airport, seaport, they pay for their vehicles. Okay. Um, the BMSD, um, um, it's well, it, get, it gets complicated, but anyway, there's there are regional vehicles for traffic, it, everything that they do. Those are the vehicles that we are referring to. Okay. All right. And and in terms of uh, the affordable housing, uh, certainly I'd like to be a part of that. The, the housing Absolutely. piece. Uh, it's important. I will I will send a memo to every commissioner about it. All right. And finally, I'm, I'm being very brief this morning. Since the federal government has rammed down our throats Juneteenth as a public holiday, uh, county attorney, is it uh, uh, required legally that we do anything, or is it now done, or do I need to bring back another item to see whether or not my liberal colleagues will join the conservative Republicans? in making Juneteenth a paid holiday for Broward County residents? Commissioner, it would require uh, board action to make it a holiday for purposes of county employees. Okay, so we will we'll need to bring that back when we come, get back from break. And, and, count, and if that's anticipated, how about union negotiation? That that's, doesn't come into play? Well, we'd have to look at the, uh, the contracts, but I believe that whatever holidays are recognized by the county probably or automatically incorporated uh, into the CBAs, but I'd have to ask uh, Adam Katzman if there's any sort of uh, negotiation or bargaining so, that would so, be required. So if the, what I add, not, um, the, the county doesn't recognize all of the federal holidays, so they're not written into the contract that way because we don't celebrate all of them. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I apologize, I, I meant if you, if the board took action to create it as a county holiday. I believe it's automatically covered in the CBAs, but we could analyze that. Yeah, okay, so, so at this point in time, it's not something that needs to be budgeted, is where I'm going, until we pass it, if, if we do. I think that's correct, sir. Is that right, Ms. Henry? It's not there unless we pass something. And right. It's, it's not automatic, okay. All right, so we'll bring it back and see what happens again. Thank you. Thank you for your done, Commissioner. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, Commissioner Ryan, did I see your hand? I wasn't sure. Yeah. Commissioner Ryan, you recognized her. And then I will wrap Mayor, it up. Mayor. And then we're done. Mayor. Yeah. Commissioner Fisher, I'm sorry. <laughs> you are after Commissioner Honus and before Commissioner Ryan. That does sometimes happen. And please accept my sincere apologies, sir. No problem. Um, and I'll be brief as well. Um, you know, also, Ms. Henry, the, uh, I'm sure the BSO is looking for some helicopters in the near future. I know those have been a, a big crime st um, stopper, so just, just be aware of that. I'm sure they're coming forward. But the vehicles for right now, I get that. Um, and, Mayor, if there's going to be some type of a working group with Commissioner Furr, I know that you know, yes, sir. doing uh, some working Yes, groups. sir, I will create a working group to be chaired you by know. Commissioner Furr. And, and even st maybe st if you're doing something in the meantime, Commissioner, maybe one of our staff members can, can join too. It doesn't have to be, does that have to be sunshine or not? I'm not well, sure. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, uh, Vice Mayor Udine, I'm glad that your item is moving forward and what we talked about uh, previously, what you did. Um, great minds think alike. I think the Young and Art facility, I was gonna say that, is a great opportunity for the film rather than building a 20,000 square foot facility. I think that is ideal. Um, Affordable housing, I am overwhelmed with uh, happiness. I want to jump up and, and shout and clap uh, because this is my third budget cycle since I've been elected, Ms. Henry, and with all the challenges that we have faced, you've, begun, you, you've gone beyond the call of duty. This is really, truly uh, an amazing budget for what we have had to work with and what you've been able to accomplish. So I just want to thank you and thank you too, Norm. Um, for all your hard work. This is really, really good stuff, so thank you. Commissioner yeah. Fisher, once again, accept my apologies for missing you, and thank you, sir. Commissioner Ryan, you're recognized. I'm sorry, County Ministry. Um, at some point, I'd like to just have a little bit of conversation about the Young at Art facility, what's going on there, and because um, that might, you know, that's that could have some sway in, in your comments, because it's, it's, there are a lot of, arts community represent 
representatives touching bases constantly about what they want to see. <clears throat> they want to see something that's analogous to the uh, art place that we- Art serve. <laughs> art serve. Um, they want to be able to ha have a, a, a multiplicity of things to do there. And this, this facility is where you would actually produce film. And so it takes up a lot of space. If you use it for that purpose, you wouldn't be able to. So we, we, have, um, we have a study, um, the, a contractor, they're out reaching out and they will be coming back with a series of recommendations that I will bring to you. And then you guys can decide just which of those things you would like to see there. But they're, they're looking to have something on the southern end, as close as we can get it, that's analogous to what's happening up here. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Henry, and I'll make some additional comments on that. Oh, uh, Commissioner Ryan, you're recognized, sir. And then I'm wrapping it up and we're going to go. Uh, I believe that Commissioner Bogan has arranged lunch. No. We've arranged uh, a lunch for everybody. Not oh. I, but uh, right. you know, we, we, I have appointed Commissioner Bogan the caterer in chief. <laughs> so we have a really nice lunch in Bertha's conference room for everybody. Like, it's not Doc B's, but uh, it's, okay. a, it's a good lunch. Commi yes, Commissioner Ryan, you're recognized, sir. Let's I, get out of here. I think, I think that Commissioner Bogan takes care of everything except for the check for payment. <laughs> so thank you very much, Commissioner Bogan. I found Commissioner Bogan to be quite generous. That's, that's especially applicable since we're talking about a budget. Uh, and he eats all the food, on, and you know it. On right? page yes, 11, does. when we're, we're dealing with the uh, Ryan. the discussion on affordable housing, with the uh, the rapid rise and uh, and the cost for purchasing homes and uh, far smaller inventory, that puts obviously a lot of pressure on on rentals. So both home ownership and the rental market has taken off considerably. Do you have any estimate? on how much we have seen an increase in home prices for ownership and rental over this past year? I'm guessing it's been somewhere around 15 percent. I think there's a lot of different estimates floating around, but I think the study that Commissioner Rich referred to will give us an update that I thought it was a few months away. Um, because I think there's a lot, it appears, condo or single family housing is up the most. Condos are quite a bit up. Um, commercial seems weird because there's some new construction stuff, but it appears to be the, un the unaffordable index is going to get worse with the update. Right, and, and home ownership versus rentals, I mean, these are, are always going to be tethered together. And, and so if we're going to see, you know, as long as the market is, is depleted in supply, I mean, it just keeps going up with that supply-demand contact point. So with that, uh, it seems to me that any additional funding that we could put in this year for affordable housing, and I'm not thinking recurring, but in the non-recurring area, on the bullet point that you have for um, the um, Rescue Act funding, you have um, non-recurring proposed for twelve and a half million. Um, that's in your um, recommendation. Is that to be spread out over a number of years. So if I might, on, on that one, we had preliminary conversations with Mr. Stone that looked at what, what happened in the year before, how many projects that were, quote, shovel ready and had the ability to go immediately. Because we, we have time constraints on the, on the Rescue Act money. So um, we are clear that we had at least this amount um, but um, we're challenging the whole industry if they have projects that are shovel ready and some actually probably could be but didn't because they were waiting for 9% credit, tax credits and, and the difference between the two is only a couple million. So we said, come on in, let's just use the, the HFA's bond allocation and we go with 4%. But there's, we, we're encouraging people with shovel ready projects to go. So that 12 and a half could be, you know, you can double that um, if there, you have shovel ready projects to go in, in next year. So this is what we knew we had if we couldn't fund the prior year. So if we get these out, the, those projects out the door and anyone else that's coming through, 
that have projects. And I, um, based on the conversation that I had yesterday, it appears that there may be some more. So, you know, that, that's a funding source that we would readily go to as long as we know they can be spent by the deadline. The constraints that we have on spending this Rescue Act money, uh, it, it will not, it would not be affected if we were to put a larger number in non-recurring funding this year for affordable housing. And if we don't spend it all down, like we frequently do, we could just roll it over into the, the next year. Because my feeling is, based upon the market conditions, and also uh, based upon that recently passed ordinance uh, that we provided additional uh, incentives for multifamily residential housing, and that actually was the mayor's proposal, uh, I, I think that we've got a lot of developers that are right there at the door and ready to go. So I, I'd like to see a larger number there if you can do so. We without, absolutely you know, can if they're committing there. Ourselves, but more to if, if a lot of developers are coming in, I don't want them to think that you know, the money you know, disappears overnight. As, as much as we could have at the ready, and then obviously you know, we have to you know, view every project with you know, our own uh, performance measures and you know quality control and things like that but that would be um, my number one item because I think that's one that we can we can make a movement without blowing up the budget and then um, uh, on animal care and I know this is actually not a, a large amount of the budget but um, as we look to do more um, reorganization in that area uh, anything that we can do to kind of leverage the uh, the potential of volunteers that we could have engage uh, with our animal care uh, facility and uh, just being able to spend more time with the with the dogs and cats that's that was a very important thing and and I believe in order to facilitate the recruiting efforts that we would need to have perhaps some more money in there so that we have a very clear lines of communication with, I'm thinking primarily with uh, kids that are doing their service hours, that uh, we could bring more of them into the facility and, and um, enhance the, you know, the, the quality of life for the animals that are in the facility. That's it for me. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan, and I will, Commissioner Furr. No, I just want to speak to the last comment. Commissioner Furr, you're Commissioner recognized, Ryan. sir. Um, I believe, uh, Commissioner Ryan, I, I don't know if you saw the brochure that we had put, that created for kids to to do community service that was that would could be distributed through all the schools, it just makes me think about if there's a way of being able to um, create that for every district that could go to all the schools. Oh, uh, that's a minor cost. No, no, no. It's but fine. that would be a, a quick way to be able to get it out to we, all we the just, students. And that that is a very um, helpful communication uh, brochure, but. For kids that are interested, I don't know, some will be calling, texting, um, but we don't want a bottleneck when, you know, kids have a thousand questions about, you know, they're making these decisions on where they're going to commit themselves for the service hours. The faster that we can respond and, and provide some detailed information on what the opportunities present and, um, I was I just know, saying, maybe I was have some of them be able to, uh, to uh, meet up with, um, an advisor or whatever to, to show you know what what we would like to see happen and and get the kids comfortable okay I was just saying because last time my office footed the bill on it but it's it's a little expensive for an office account so if it was you know if all of us had access to that it, I think it'd be a good thing okay. Very, you. not that big a, not that big a thank idea. you Commissioner Fur, Commissioner Ryan so to close it out um, County, Mr. Foster, County Administrator, County Administrator Desden, I'm extremely pleased, again, as I said earlier, with your budget. Um, I actually, despite all rumors to the contrary, try and be fiscally conservative on spending recurring money. This time, because of federal recovery dollars, I've asked for a lot of one-time monies in here, and. A lot of them are in here, and I wanted to thank you on that. Um, again, I've been the county representative for, I think it's three years or so, to the Cultural Council, and there's additional one-time money only in here for PACA and for the grants because they, everybody, the cultural programs were all shut down, couldn't sell tickets, and that's in here. 
Um, one of my huge issues, and the biggest one I think I've had, is job creation. And if anybody here has not been to the Nova Southeastern University Levan Center yet, I strongly recommend you go. The additional money for that is in here. The apprenticeship program that I sponsored, the money for that is in here. I was going to bring up what, what Vice Mayor Udine did on both the computer security on page seven and the video dispatch on page eight, but Vice Mayor Udine already brought up both of those, so I'll just mention those in passing. Um, the, um, I think that, I, I hope that there is sufficient dollars or sometimes fungible, so I hope that we have added to our reserves here because I know we're going to need them at some point. I know we can't directly use uh, the federal um, uh, Recovery Act funds for reserves, but we can use it for money that we might have otherwise spent. So I'm hoping we build reserves because I know that you know, we're not getting this federal money every year and we need to make sure we've reserved as much as we can. Uh, in reference to affordable housing, you've heard me say this before, I've disagreed with the two-tenths of a mill on recurring because we just don't have that money on a recurring basis. But I think you've done a masterful job in finding one time money for that. And I suspect that we may have, in fact, more money than we can use this year. So again, excellent job on that. Last thing I was going to comment on was film. Um, on the reference to the Young at Art, I'm not sure that does work for because, as I said, and I know the arts community feels that in West Broward, there really is almost nothing county funded. So they're looking for something comparable to ArtServe with a multi-purpose stage, with, a, with, again, we have the library, with some other things which have yet to be defined. But the bigger issue is we have been told that you need a 35-foot ceiling for a sound stage, and although there's high ceilings there, I don't think the 30, well, I'm not sure that they're the 35 feet that we need. We also have been told we need something that you can drive tractor trailers into, and I don't think there's anything there, but I'm happy to talk about anything. Um, we, By the way, we had Emilio Estefan here in the uh, uh, manager's conference room, the administrator's conference room. Man, it's brilliant and it real, made us realize how much we still have to learn about film, but between Dr. Sharif and I, I think we've been fairly effective at, at starting the process to bring a lot of high paid jobs back to Broward County. Um, I'm done, I just wanted to once again close, unless there's any other comments, I wanted to close by thanking uh, for a really good budget the administrator, the administrator designate, and Mr. Foster, I would like to remind everybody to please, you know, tell everybody you know to get vaccinated. I will call, quick question, you want a meeting July or August for a workshop, late July, early August? No. I'll, I'll, I'll send something out just, again, for the affordable housing working group. I'll just send out a memo to, to every commissioner asking when they want to do something. Um, and stay safe, thank you, and I will see you all in August. We are adjourned.